If you're interested in ukulele and instrument building, then I think you're going to really enjoy the conversation that I'm about to share with you. Recently, I interviewed Brian Griffin, who was the luthier who built one of my favorite instruments to play, a custom tenor ukulele made with a unique kasha bracing system. In this interview, Brian is going to share some of his techniques of building and will answer some common questions that I get about this ukulele. For years, people ask me, why is the sound hole over here? Why does the bridge, why is it shaped like this? Is this really a piece of New York City water tower as the soundboard? And why does the kasha bracing system produce such a rich sound? Well, Brian is going to share his secrets of building with you. He's a wonderful guy, and I think you'll enjoy our conversation. So sit back and enjoy a little conversation with Brian Griffin of Griffin Ukuleles. So we have with us today the luthier, Brian Griffin. Welcome, Brian. I wanted to introduce you to my audience here at Ukulele Zen. So if you'd uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you into the art of building instruments. Okay, good morning, Stu. Nice to have you back in the workshop. Yeah, it's good to be there. <laughs> Virtually anyway. I spent 35 years as an insurance broker many years ago and I was able to retire and uh, devote the rest of my days to, to uh, aesthetic things that pleased me. And uh, ukuleles are a little new for me. I, I actually not so new. When I was in high school, I had an ukulele, um, a little soprano. It didn't last very long because on my senior prom, my date sat on it in the back of the car and broke it. At any rate. Oh, wow. So ukuleles and I go back a ways, but it really recently started, uh, took a little soprano ukulele to, Mount, uh, to Hawaii and wanted to take a lesson and the instructor was a music store owner, and he was playing a big, beautiful Kamaka tenor, and I lusted after that tenor. Mm -hmm. He wanted $900 for it, and I thought ukuleles cost 12 or 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I've been a woodworker for most of my days, and, and I came home and found online uh, a Honolulu company, Honolima. Uh, that sells a workbook and a plan. And I bought that for 25 bucks and built a ukulele. That was about 12 years ago. Been doing it ever since. I got hooked. Well, you certainly have been hooked. Uh, how many ukuleles have you made since then? This is 151, 151. Ukulele, 151. This one is just like yours. And in fact, this is being built by one or for one of your uh, one of your students who wanted one just like yours. Oh, so this okay. is Redwood from a New York City water tank, by the way. And this is East Indian Rosewood. Brian, what are some of the principles that guide you when you are making a ukulele? What are the elements that you put into the design? Uh, the first principle is to work for the best tone and sound you can, you can develop. So I, for many years, 10 years at least, I built standard ukuleles, ukuleles. Here's one with the sound hole in the center and uh, the, you know, this is just the standard tenor ukulele. They were very good and I enjoyed them very much. But I started going to Hawaii, to Maui, and there I learned about Eric Devine, who is one of the nation's, one of the world's best ukulele builders, in my opinion. And I was fascinated because he used a different design. He called it the Kasha design. And I loved the sound of his ukes. So when I got to building my, when I finished my 99th standard ukulele, I decided I'd try something different. And I bought the same plan that Eric Devine used the Kasha plan, and I built my first Kasha ukulele. I just thought it was far better. And in fact, Stu, that's, that first 
my 100th youth, my first kasha, is the one that you played here in my workshop. Yeah, I remember that. Buy one. So it still sounds pretty good. It sounds really rich. Um, can you just to tell everybody a little more about that? What is the kasha bracing system and why does it why does it make it so much louder and richer of a sound? Stu, it helps to first show you the standard. You know, the normal ukuleles are braced this way with a with two crossbars. This is the inside of the ukulele, the inside of the soundboard. Two big crossboards that go from uh, cross braces, which go from side to side, and a big hole in the center. And that essentially kills all the sound that you get from the upper bout. And all the sound has to come from below. Kasha was as Kasha was a physicist at one of the Florida universities who bought his son a guitar about 20 years ago, and he got interested in acoustics, being a scientist, and he did a lot of experimenting, and then he contacted a famous luthier named Schneider, and together they came up with the Kasha bracing system, which they claim is, and I believe, is more efficient. So here's what it looks like. And, and you notice that um, there are no braces that go from side to side. Yeah. The, the sound hole, a little bit smaller, is set way over here on the, on the right-hand side or the left-hand side, depending on which, which end you're looking from. And these tone bars radiate out from this trumpet-shaped bridge. And this is a brace under the bridge. Um, and none of them go clear to the edge. So you can imagine, you know, an ukulele or a guitar is simply a, 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 a drum uh, that's pulsing like this. Mm -hmm. So this whole, this simply means more of the soundboard can vibrate to make sound. And that's why Kasha is, uh, the Kasha bracing system is so effective. He also learned that, that the bass strings need to be braced more heavily. And that's why this is trumpet shaped. The can brace you hold that up a little higher so we can see? So that's the side where the, bra where the, the bass strings are braced. So they, uh, they are braced more heavily. And this is the thinner side of the trebles. Kind of, kind of simple. But the basic difference is more vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really feel it. And, and so the sound hole being in the where it is, is that a choice of design or is that an aesthetic choice? Like, why is it not in the center? It would get in the way of the bracing, wouldn't it? it sure, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a design feature. It's way over here on the side. Um, leaving this side to vibrate. So when I first encountered this instrument, Brian, you let me into your shop and you led me through a whole bunch of different choices of wood. You explained to me that this redwood, very, very special top, and there were many different grades of uh, quality from one to five. And I was really blown away as you held up each piece of wood right to my ear. And when you tapped it, it made the sound of a marimba. Boom. It really had a ring. It had a sustain. And I was really, really into that idea. And there are also other nice design elements that you put in, like reinforcing the, the neck with a piece of carbon fiber. Of course, the kasha bracing. So we'll have to have you explain what kasha bracing is. But I just want to, uh, could you just tell folks, in your own words, um, what is this piece of wood? Where did it come from? Because I think this is really interesting. This is redwood, California redwood, that many years ago was sent to New York City and built into a water tank. And so if you build a building taller than six stories in New York, you have to put a water tank on top. Since the Civil War, they built water tanks with California redwood. I, 
Um, apparently there are 15,000 uh, water tanks, wooden water tanks still in New York City. Hmm. And as the metal parts of those water tanks fail, but the redwood remains excellent, even better than originally because it's been absorbing minerals from New York water for gosh knows, maybe a maybe hundred years. So I have a contact that in New York that sends me redwood like this, cut from the staves of those old water tanks. And I saw it thin and, uh, and it ends up like, like this, which is joined, book matched, joined together to make the wonderful sounding tops on your uke and many others that I've made. Yeah, that redwood is it's so interesting to think that it's such an old wood to begin with, uh, and then that it's been absorbing minerals, and it has this history. Um, how old is do you think the tree would be that this oh, came from? This, this wood probably has, uh, looks like about 40, 40 growth rings per inch. And so 40, and this is what, five inches wide? This is 200 feet. It took the tree 200 years to grow that wide. And a redwood tree can be, you know, 30 feet wide. Those are probably, some of those trees were probably planted or seeded before Christ. It's amazing. Someday when you have nothing to do, if that ever happens, <laughs> to get, a, get a microscope. Or a, and count the growth rings in your ukulele. Yeah, I, I maybe I'll. I'll well, tell you what. When I come out, when I come out west again, uh, we should do that. I've had this since. I mean, I think you mailed it to me in November of 2018. So it's going on just over two years now. It keeps getting louder and louder, richer and richer. And there's one other feature that makes that vibration, and that is the Spanish technique. Of, of attaching the neck, the sides to the neck. Most, most ukuleles these days are made where you make a body, a box, and you make a neck, and you either screw and glue them together or you put them together with, a, with some sort of a fancy woodworking joint. But the old Spanish guitars, the old Spanish makers made, made them this way. They, you see this cut? In the neck, and the this is and the bent side then is inserted into that. Yeah, and bent around obviously, and then the top is glued to the well. It's all glued together. It it makes us a, a more cohesive whole, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. and the neck, the neck, your neck vibrates too. The whole instrument. Is alive in that way. You can really feel it. Spanish, some of the old methods are better. Mm. Factories can't afford to do this. It takes too long. It takes it's too much handwork. It's much easier to make a body, make a neck, and screw them together. And just glue them together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was another feature that you added that I really liked. Um, uh, there is a piece of carbon fiber underneath the fret board and that adds some stability to the neck there's no truss rod for adjusting the neck in this instrument but that um you know living here in cold vermont and then getting on a plane to hot and dry you know santa cruz or someplace like that for a festival i've noticed the neck and the intonation has been totally stable for two years and i think that that piece of carbon fiber really secures the neck in a big way I put it in there so that it, it will never warp. Yeah, no. it's working. I also uh, noticed that when you built this, at first the you had the fretboard positioned differently. If you hold up number 100, and uh, this is what was really fun about working with you is that you were so open to you know trying out some new things. I like to play up high and play some 
do. I have never up there in the nosebleeds. So you had it in a different way, and you just flipped it upside down. Was was that hard to do, or? Oh, it was very easy. I just I'd never met anybody that played that far up on the neck, and uh, uh, so aesthetically, I did it that way. But when you said you couldn't get up to your high E or whatever it was, yeah. I just flipped it over and. It was easy. So now all of my ukes are made that way. Yeah, it's 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 a nice design feature, and and I have to say, even without a cutaway, I um I didn't know how we, how comfortable it would be with a cutaway, but it is very comfortable to reach these in. The intonation still in there. That's a good one of those. Very good intonation. My favorite uke. This is this is uh, uh, bear claw spruce mm. and mahogany. And uh, part of the fun of challenge and the fun of making ukuleles is to use different woods and and try different things to get different sounds. So this is a very nice responsive uke and. You know, I've never been too thrilled with the look of mahogany, but I think I now I really like it, and I've learned why Martin uh, guitar or ukuleles were always uh, mahogany. Maybe it was inexpensive at, uh, in those days, I don't know, but it, it's excellent wood. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different woods and excellent woods to make good-sounding instruments, and they all sound a little different. Each wood imparts a little different sound. Yeah, well, it's um, it's cool that you have so many uh, different choices of woods. But Brian, are you making other sizes besides uh, tenor, or do you? I, I believe you you've made quite a few baritones, isn't that right? I made a number of baritones. Yep, I just just sent one off to California. It sounded great, uh, and I recently made a couple of concerts, and I still have one. Let's see if I still have it here. This is a little concert. And I didn't know if Kasha design would work well with concerts, but it does. And this one is particularly interesting because I have a granddaughter who lives in India. And she came to visit about a year ago and she brought me some crazy wood from India, just a plank of, of wood that she didn't know what it was and I don't know what it is. Hmm. But it turned out to be kind of pretty wood. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Hold, can you hold that back up again? Let's see that. Uh, that's is that book matched or is that just a solid piece? Uh, no, that's book matched. Book matched, yeah. That's With Port Orford cedar top. So she's uh, back visiting now, and next week I'm going to give her this. This is going to be a surprise for her. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> be a nice send off. So there are all kinds of fascinating woods too. Uh, Here's a great wood. I mentioned my friend who sends me the redwood from, he lives in Philadelphia. He's also a luthier. Uh, his name is, he makes Jupiter ukuleles, a very fine luthier. And we trade wood. So he sends me sycamore and this cedar from our New York water tanks. And I send him maple and spruce from uh, that, that is native here. So we have a nice up, a nice trade-off going. But sycamore makes a spectacular instrument. Look at that crazy grain. It's beautiful. And it makes a good sounding uke. Very nice. The headstock on this one, if I remember correctly, it's spalted maple. Yes. Yeah, spalted maple. And, 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 and I appreciate you doing the inlay here as well. I requested a yin yang, uh, and it seems that you've taken to putting them on all the instruments since. Uh, all of them, many of them. And I kind of like it too. But strangely enough, Stu, you got me in trouble because when I started making this and, and you started showing your, your yin yang, people say, well, I had a woman who was a, a coleopterist, a bee collector. I mean, a beetle collector. She wanted a beetle, so she sent me an image of a beetle, a dung beetle. <laughs> <laughs> a dung, the dung beetle, Ook, that would be a specialty. So I, 
I had recently sent to her a dung beetle ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> now I've got a woman in Spain, one of your one of your clients, who wants a dragon. So uh, you're making my life more complicated, my friend. Well, uh, gosh, you know, I guess you 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 might have to have a policy. It's uh, yin yang or nothing, or or yeah. so, something to make it something to make it a little easier on yourself. Uh, I do remember you saying clearly to me. Um, I think I, this may not be a direct quote, but I don't do bling on the ukulele, like. Like I won't put a lot of fancy stuff, and there is plenty of beauty to this, um, this piece of tiger. I believe it's tiger maple or tiger koa that you put here. It's our local Pacific Northwest big leaf maple. Big, big leaf. leaf maple. That was it. But I remember you saying this. This is the bling. You know, no. Yeah, it's all the bling you get. Of pearl. Uh, Except maybe a dragon or a dung beetle once in a while. Maybe a dragon or a dung beetle. Hey, I just got another question about this. What is the advantage and purpose of a sound port? A lot of people ask about the upper sound port. Why is it there? Does it make a difference? Like, what, what would you say? Well, you, I say to the people who ask me that question, have you ever played in a group with 20 or 30 uh, in a jam with 20 or 30 people and you're banging away and you're own ukulele and you can't even hear what you're doing hmm. with a sound port, a side sound port that sends music back to your ear. And that's why they're in there. Yeah, I can definitely feel it. Um, this instrument vibrates big in a big way. Uh, the Kasha bracing system makes a, a big difference. One of the fun, uh, I wanted to have a travel uke. I was fascinated by Kala's little narrow, thin ukes that put out a lot more sound than, than I would have expected. So I decided to design one of my own. So this is a very thin, this way, narrow uh, soprano, but I carve a, a fancy piece of maple for the back. To add some beauty, but also it's concave and it seems to create more sound. So these have been very popular. But because the shape is kind of like the shape of the old Kamaka pineapple, I didn't want to copy pineapple. I wanted to make this all out of Pacific Northwest woods. Mm -hmm. So I call this the pine cone. Ah, nice. <laughs> the pine cone, not the pine apple. Cone. <laughs> anyway, then I use Engelman spruce for the top, nice warm sound, and walnut for the neck from a tree that grew here in Bellingham. And look at that lovely maple. So I make these in soprano and in concert, in the concert. They've been, they've been very, these are really nice little ukes. Yeah, that's sweet. Well, Brian, how, how can people get in touch with you if they're interested in your work or your ukuleles? Well, I'd recommend that they check my website, griffinukuleles.com, and my phone number's on there, and I'm happy to talk with folks. Okay, cool. Yeah, you really are generous with your time. Uh, appreciate you spending this time with me. And um, just to let people know that once Brian starts working on ukuleles, he's a, an active blogger. So there's a blog page on the website where you can track the progress of your uke and you can also look at other builds. And that was exciting for me and exciting to see what, you know, the process of what's going on. So there's all kinds of pictures and Brian tells the story of each build there on the blog. I enjoy doing that and people really seem to, to enjoy it as well sweet well brian thanks for uh thanks for meeting with me and it's good to see you again i hope uh hope you and your wife are doing well out there in bellingham thank you so much Stu. get back out of here one day i hope to yes i really look forward to it i love the northwest good